Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Good. Can y'all hear me okay in the back? Good. Thank you. Uh, welcome to a celebration of literature and living writers. My name is Megan Marshall. I'm the director of the QC High Living Writers Series. Tonight is the first event of our spring series, and we're kicking it off with an amazing author who is a testament to our powerful writing community here in San Diego. And also, this has kind of like become his unofficial book launch. So a lot of exciting things happening this evening. Um, before I introduce him, I do want to thank those folks who have helped to make this event and this series possible. And that includes all of our friends here at Love Library, my fabulous co-host, Markle Tumlin, holding it down in the back over there, and our other friends from Love Library, Donnie Luca Hall, Laura Bliss, and Rebecca Williamson. I also want to thank the Department of English and Comparative Literature and Instructionally Related Activities for their continued support of our series. And lastly, um, I think it's essential to acknowledge the space that we are privileged to share. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations. And as members of the San Diego State University community, we acknowledge this legacy. So just one last thing, if you have not done so already, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And uh, a quick note that the event is being recorded, but don't worry, all we see is this. So unfortunately, none of y'all are going to be YouTube stars tonight. I am honored to introduce our first featured reader of the semester. Manuel Paul Lopez's books include Nerve Curriculum, which was just released this year by a feature poem, which we are celebrating this evening. These Days of Candy, the Yearning Feed, which won the Ernest Sandine Poetry Prize, and Death of a Mexican and other poems. He also co-edited three anthologies, Reclaiming Our Stories in the Time of COVID and Uprising, Reclaiming Our Stories 2, and Reclaiming Our Stories, all three from San Diego City Works Press, and all three generated from a community-based writer's workshop of the same name that he's co-facilitated since 2016 in Southeast San Diego. He has published additional work in Bilingual Review, Ziziva, uh, Hanging Loose, and Rattle, among many other journals. His honors include a Cantamundo Fellowship, a Pushcart Prize nomination, and support from San Diego Foundation's Creative Catalyst Fund. Currently, although he's on sabbatical this semester, but usually you can find him teaching literature, creative writing, and composition to some very lucky students at San Diego City College. Paul Lopez's work has been described as delirious, profound, sharp, sensuous, and snappy, and his aesthetic is impossible to pin down. Critics often like to pigeonhole poets with labels like nature poet, language poet, surrealist, formalist, and sometimes these labels are warranted. But Lopez's vast poetic voice defies characterization. Like Whitman, he contains multitudes and more. An amalgam of persona, screenplay, soundscape, manifesto, satire, and paradox. His willingness to be delightfully irreverent pushes the boundaries of what poetry can do and is helping to pave a way outside of the standard academic bubble. Of Lopez's latest collection, poet Tim Z. Hernandez raves, Nerve curriculum reaches beyond cult cultural tropes and played out storytelling in an attempt to invent its own form. By the end of the journey, we find ourselves in a choral existence, a collective voice, a hive of piercing oneness that stays with us long after the final note. Paul Lopez is a beast in the house of contemporary poetics. So please join me in welcoming Manuel Paul Lopez. Hey everybody, <laughs> how's it going? Are we doing okay tonight? All right, okay. Thank you so much for that, Megan. That was amazing. Um, it, yeah, it, it is. It is really a delight to be here tonight. Um, as Megan mentioned, um, this is sort of a, a launch for 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 me in this book. Um, 
it, there was some delays, but um, it is out, and I just received my copies on Friday, so I'm really excited. I've just been staring at them for the last <laughs> few days, and, and it's been a while. You see, um, the 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 book itself, the manuscript was taken in in 20, 2019, late 2019, and um, it was taken for publication, I think, in early 2020. So it's to see it now and see this work in this form has has been a real uh, again delight. So. Thank you again for being here. I know there are so many other places you can be and there's some familiar faces in the room and it just brings joy to my heart and it warms me up and thank you. Thank you, thank you. I do wanna uh, um, thank also the, the English department, comparative literature department for having us, uh, having me, not us, right? Um, and, 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 and the various programs that, that have helped put this, this series together. It is really, really amazing. I've been coming for years. I participated in some and, and I've been in the audience for many. So thank you. Um, tonight, uh, my parents were supposed to be here, um, but they couldn't make it last minute. So that's unfortunate, but I know they're here. Um, they're just, uh, they couldn't be in this physical space uh, tonight. Hello, everybody. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I don't normally do this, but tonight I'm going to dedicate this reading to them. Um, so nerve curriculum, um, yeah, I'm gonna begin with a short piece. Well, actually, I'm gonna read an excerpt. I'm gonna start from the end. I'm gonna work myself self backwards, see, see what happens to it. Dispatches from the hive of the bee, one. Wicho socked Iggy across the forehead when he finally caught up to him on 4th Street, aiming at a blue and white cloudy Iggy had had his eyes on all spring semester. Before this cataclysmic encounter, Iggy knelt quietly, a Zen master in ocean deep meditation, with one eye closed, his lucky cat's eye boulder cocked in his thumb, ready to win another monumental game of ringer. This was the Kanika game that we played in our neighborhood that instantaneously drew thick demarcations between legends and losers for generations to come. When what seemed to be like an inevitable victory, we shall pick Iggy's bony ass up from the dirt lot we used exclusively for these types of marble games and after school rumbles and pop the top of Iggy's dome with a quick flurry of coscorrones that gave birth to a cartoonish high rise chichon. In one swift motion, Weichel snatched Iggy by the neck and guided him straight back to 7-Eleven while shaking him every so often to accent a colorful phrase he uttered. Iggy shuffled next to Weichel defenselessly, and the crowd left behind watched defenselessly, for they all knew Iggy would soon bear the weight that so many generations of the bullied and big beaten before him had been made to mule, and there was nothing, absolutely nothing, anyone could do about it. You see, Iggy beat Weichel's high score on Galaga by 12,000 points. When the news hit the streets like a cold, cold War air raid siren, the homies knew Iggy's hard-fought achievement was really an act of war. In disbelief, we all choked on our slurpees when we heard Carlos's slobber-laden account of the play-by-play -play as he struggled to push each syllable through the new orthodontic retainer his mama had forbidden him to remove. He what? We shouted. How could anybody beat the shit out of little Iggy? We asked not because we doubted Mitchell, but because we all knew he was ruthless as a blood clot in our collective nervous systems. A decorated boxer at 11 with a slow, deliberate swagger already evident in his Nike Cortezes as they glided across elementary school playgrounds each year. He was like Montoya, the great Cholo general in American Me. Cool, heartless, and methodical. Iggy, on the other hand, was a small 10-year-old sensitive Chicanito who collected Cabbage Patch Kids and demonstrated an early acumen for urban development when he first began constructing elaborate cities with train sets as stand-ins for trolley and subway systems in his backyard. Iggy, by eons, was the smartest kid at school who wore glasses so large and so thick we swore he oversaw the universe while he stood perched on the community center swimming pool's diving board. Hell, Iggy's library card had even been bronzed one summer when he set an all-time record for checking out the most library books related to single-cell organisms over vacation. Iggy's parents paced their front yard when it was apparent he might not make it home before sundown. 
Everyone knew that the sun's weakening heat on our forearms as evening approached was Iggy's requisite weekend curfew. Iggy's parents soon enlisted the neighborhood denizens to help them search the sleek, steamy summer day streets for their mejito avenues, according to his hyper-paranoid parents that would soon darken to zero visibility when the sun set in a jungle of mosquitoes, child molesters, and chupacabras populated the darkness. It was nights like these that Iggy's mama swore she heard the yowls of distant recess monkeys hollering danger from the trees. All evening, a menagerie of parents, grandparents, tios y tias, and neighborhood kids, although they knew the truth but would never ever blurt a, blurt a hint of it, walked be behind Sergeant Venegas' police car as it crawled up and down the block with Iggy's father holding a police issue full horn to his mouth, yelling, Iggy, mijo, come out, we're not mad at you. Your mom made you chilaquiles, your favorite breakfast for dinner. <laughs> While Iggy's mom walked alongside him, convinced her lamb had been stung by a bee and lay suffering somewhere from an anaphylactic attack, her Iggy curled into a fetal position, trembling, emitting quick micro breaths beneath the bogambia he used for shelter. We need to save my boy, she cried. Bees love Iggy because his skin smells just like Hamoncillo. <laughs> the search party never bothered to check 7-Eleven. It was four blocks away from Iggy's house and Iggy was forbidden to leave his own side of the block without adult supervision. Unbeknownst to them, however, Iggy had been secretly venturing from the virtual corrugated fence his parents had installed in his mind to hang out with the boys at Buckland Park, the new star alley in 7-Eleven. Liberation never felt so great, he exclaimed one dusty afternoon while riding handlebars on Jesus' PK Ripper. Que viva Agosto Sandino, que viva Pancho Villa. In a United Color Guard timed response, the nine boy BMX procession shouted there, you're one of us now, Grito, y que viva Iggy Higgs. It took Iggy two and a half weeks of clandestine trips to America's favorite neon 24 hour convenience store to shatter the Mount Everest of adolescent feats an achievement that would have made Che Guevara proud. As we held our collective breath and stood physiologically hopped on caramellos and super biggles and envy, we all waited with wide-eyed anticipation for the day Iggy could finally type his initials into the dark, star-studded galactic screen that would stand securely undisturbed on a Himalayan heap of quarters for centuries. And we knew it wouldn't be long thereafter before Iggy stomped on St Stephen Krogman's 15,999,990 point world record. The world was changing and Iggy was its drum major. We received the details that filled the gaps in Carlos's initial report compliments of Leon Munoz's death defying reconnaissance mission. He secretly followed the two boys on foot from 4th Street like a Viet Cong guerrilla fighter using mulberry trees and oleanders among the way to help camouflage himself in his Saturday's finest, a complete Mexican national soccer team uniform knockoff. Leon reported back to us later that day as we huddled in an undisclosed alley, listening to the bludgeoning heroics of dear Ignacio Guadalupe Hidalgo Montes. Yo, bro, Leon ushered, assured us. John Rambo didn't have it this bad, dude. And we all know here that he got the ass whooping of ass whoopings at the hands of Captain Vin and Rambo. First Blood Part Two. A wave of head nods serpentined among the group until we all secretly thought of Rambo's beautiful Vietnamese contact, Ko Bao, sly smiles, subtly taking residence on every one of our brown faces. With Iggy's nose bloodied and his eyes swollen beneath his eyeglasses, apparently Rachel had the decency to remove them before dropping a set of fiery combinations to Iggy's bambi brown eyes. Iggy stood at Gallica and played for hours, depositing quarters into a machine that accepted them obediently alongside Rachel's fists tightened like small sacks of flour ready to explode across Iggy's chin at the first sign of resignation. Rudolph, the cashier, AKA Pac-Man Fever, because of his uncanny ability to catch cheese puffs in his mouth, fired at him from a slingshot 20 yards out, did nothing to intervene. He was Weecho's older brother, brother's homeboy, and understood the importance of a Machiavellian neighborhood rule. Pac-Man Fever simply broke change laughingly as Weecho dropped dollar after dollar on the counter generously footing the bill that would rewrite the annals of history. And I'm gonna stop there, but um, if you wanna know the rest, you gotta, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, um, thank you. So that's uh, the, the, the standard gigs, um, which is actually the oldest piece of the book. Uh, uh, it, it goes back a number of years. Um, but it was one of those that, that had just kind of been laying around and I, and I wanted to find a way for it to, 
to exist beyond a file on my computer. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to work backwards, like I mentioned. Um, this one is a little bit trippy, uh, and it just came to me from a, from a. I heard the word sentient one day, and it just caught on to me, and it started developing into something. And it's called the Foot Parade, and it goes. The sentients ate my field of apricots and flowered the evening with their blue breath. Their silence and inability to apologize is a poem dedicated to space travel and irreverent bunnies. A little yellow book sits by my desk lamp and listens to me agonize over this month's electric bill. Hands wave from the other side of a glass door fogged with old pork breath. Who are the sentients, my pops asked, and why did they choose you? Look at them, the way they grasp that soil with their ashy hands and feed it to each other. If the poem's origins are quiet enough, you'll see. This is silence and soliloquy upended and thirsty for more. It widens beyond the palm frond tattooed on my neighbor's back like an antenna dispatching chisme to the moon. Assess love like a waiting swan inventing grass. You devoured a clock in a box of cigars while my inner city plowed through an angry sea mob of waves and cement boots. Silver fish sleep in grass, grass hustling trigger-ready heartbits in their dreams. You undid the green that made the grass a hero of us all when our only duty was to maintain the grass's greenness. I heard the purple flower music again, then died, a scent they dragged out the door. Um, the next one is called The Education, and it's after the poet, the South uh, Korean poet, Kim Hai-soon, who has been very important for me over the last maybe 12 years. Um, once Kim Hai-soon's work started getting published, you know, here in the States and translation by Dami Shea, uh, and it's just been incredible. And it just opened me, me you know, in, in a way that, that, that I didn't know was possible before. Anyway, she, she wrote a poem in there called The Ghost School, and it's basically about ghosts going to school. And um, I wanted to kind of interact with that. So this is called the, the Education, and it's short. Ghost teacher calls me permanently unfinished. Ghost rector nicknames me tiny and capable. A fallen ghost basically adds up to nothing, one, one, one. Our eyelashes fall in our voices, drip from the inner faucets of ourselves a few times and then no more. Sometimes I feel like an empty speech bubble, an invest, invisible comic strip so no one laughs. Many of us simply want to read our poetry by the river 111. Many of us want to say so long to this curriculum without fingerprints nor with one last breath spared. Many of us just want to read our poetry by the river to close our eyes and be just as such. A slip real quick. <laughs> this next joint is called the bullets. <laughs> and I think it's, it, it is, it's a response to a lot of the, the violence that we've seen over the years. And again, like I said, this was stuff was written and turned in in 2019. And of course, we've seen a lot of more um, violence and tragedy. Shit, I mean, you know, it's just, it's just a constant layering, right? Um, so this is the, the poem in resistance, and if the people are not going to do it, maybe the, the little bullets can. Here we go. The bullets. Ernie the painter carved a bullet from a small milk carton and saved it for a rainy day when everything would become wet and disintegrate and drink from the sky. Oh, denim bullet. Oh, woolen bullet. Oh, Venetian velvet bullet. Sticky weather and polyurethane mitten, bullet. Bullets of sand, of salad greens, of dimpled cheek. Bullets of blood cells rattling among the interior of the human harp, of heartbreak, of baby wipes, of hollow bone chime and mechanical pencil lead. Bullets of the imagination released like a silver waterfall from a sleeper's ear, bedtime harbor. 
infantry a bullet sewn of old sweaters and its pledge to keep us warm. Bullets that walk into the sawdust rink and align themselves according to height and depth until one clears its throat. And then they're off. Pow, a singing bunch. Lyrics about the world and the stars and the universe and the promise to reject the compositions of another violent kind of work. Um, okay. Pillow talk. In high school, gagger meant methamphetamine. Got any gagger, got any gagger, got any gagger. In high school, we called small piles of glassy meth shavings wrapped in Kleenex pillows. We placed them on our tongues to avoid the excruciating nasal fry that threatened to rocket shit straight out the tops of our motherfucking heads if we snorted. Oh, cute dime store plutonium trinket trinkets, goo -gaw explosives, dear ice yellow Maximus, detonation powder. My brain was a 24 hour convenience store. The gag never sleep. The gag wander waywardly through the corridors of the glass metropolis called Moore. Fistfuls of household disinfectant seesawed my guts. I, cost, I coughed up the sharp stench of Clorox. I scrubbed sunshine from my stiff bash as a Pacific and drove a Jeep straight through my family's 24 hour roadblock. One, my breath disinfected my red headed high school principal's comb over. Two, my breath ate the rusty hinges off the public bathroom doors adjacent to the junior varsity baseball field. Three, my breath eagle-eyed sleep like a jealous snoop donning green construction gloves, a trench coat, and a pair of pliers. Four, my breath bleached the meth howl of masturbation. Five, my breath pounded three tombstones through my childhood skull. In high school, gagger meant methamphetamine. In high school, I was a numbers man who flunked physics when I blew glass through my nose. In high school, we called small piles of glass meth shavings wrapped in Kleenex pillows. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> um, time is it? Okay. All right, so there's the, there's a, a number of different looks in this in this book. So I, I was really into like using script and play and, and, and uh, verse plays. There's a big long verse play, like 16 scenes in this book in the middle of it. Um, and there are a few other smaller ones, and this is one of those. And this was kind of in response to a, a, a ESPN, I think it was ESPN, that did the 30 30 uh, documentary series, right? And it was one where I saw uh, Dwight Gooden and Daryl Strawberry. And that was really important to me because I was a big uh, Dwight, both of them, but I was mainly a Dwight Gooden fan. And as a kid, I, I tried to model my own pitching after, after, <laughs> after Doc, right? And um, but that 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 documentary really showed a different side to me. So um, and some of the things that he was struggling with were when I didn't know, you know, the time. Um, so there's two characters in this short little script, and one is hashtag rookie of the year, and the other is the rosin bag. And the rosin bag on a pitching mound is uh, how would you explain it? It's like a little bag that you pick up for grip. Right. So if you're pitching, you're sweaty, yeah, it powers up. Yeah. Yeah. So it chocks up the, the hand so you can have a better grip on it. So it's a con it's a it's a conversation between this rosin bag and and this rookie of the year and their friend. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name the, the character out, so hopefully it'll be apparent as I read it. I'll just start with the first one. So the play the play is called play. Original. Okay. <laughs> so uh, hashtag rookie of the year begins, he says. You know what it feels like to possess a glass object beneath your chest that is on the verge of constant breakage. No, I saw my fragility incarnate. There were moments when I needed to simply sit myself on the pitcher's mound and cry, but I didn't, much to my detriment. You ask the cocaine, the cocaine replies, cocaine is, cocaine is all I. Uh-huh, uh-huh, oh, hashtag rookie of the year, please continue this tale. And so it was an ice cube that just sat that sat just beneath the umpire's skull, always melting. My work was a race against that melting. I missed the World Series parade. Millions of people waited, and I'm still picking up the stepped-on ticker tape and the faded confetti everywhere I go. 
I knew you. You were the great one. As I graced your hand, I embarked upon space travel. My hands, your hand, I was vilified by the media. So, so my mother and father bore the shame. And now that media bears the shame. You were a meteorite that flew over Manhattan. You keep flying over Manhattan. I scrawled your name in dirt beneath me and waited patiently for the next, though I knew the next would never come. There's only one. 19 Ks, 20 plus game winner, Cy Young, rookie prince. Let's write a new script and forget. From your hand, I reached someone's heaven. I'm a candle that won't blow out. Oh, hush and heal. None of this is for real. Thank you. Okay. So like I said, the, the big one, the 16th scene, when I play it in here in verse play, and it's called Los Kioscos. And I'll just read the, the, the first page. And it says, three kiosks sit at the foot of a large empty stadium parking lot. Three parking attendants converse while they wait. In the distance, a small outline of the stadium is visible. Cars never arrive. As a matter of fact, the parking attendants have been working days, weeks, months maybe, without attending to a single event goer. The attendants cannot be seen in the kiosk because the windows are tinted. Each time they speak, the attendants slide open a plexiglass circle that allows the others, including the audience, to hear them. All right, so check this. So this. This was kind of inspired by seeing, you know, Qualcomm Stadium get demolished. And I remember seeing it was supposed to seem post-apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic, whatever you want to use. But it was a trip and you know, that was a, you know, I had, I had gone there for years, you know, like many of us, you know, seeing concerts and, 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 and sports and things like that. So it just got me thinking. So anyways, it's these three kiosks and this broken down Coliseum behind it. All right. And they're talking to each other. And again, I'm not going to I'm not going to say who's speaking. Hopefully you can get that through the through this. And I'm only going to read a scene or two because it's very long. But just so you can get kind of a sense of it. Three kiosks and they're talking to each other. And they're waiting and no one ever comes. And they're called A, B and C. Okay. Is this kiosk really a coffin, A? Eh? Is it? Just say it. If you think it's a coffin, I mean, just sleep tonight, B. We'll wake you if they come. So scene one. Early morning, the sun is bright, clear day. And I'm gonna mispronounce a lot of these animal names, but please forgive me, animals. Okay, in my kiosk, A begins, in my kiosk, I've worn a Rook's blue flycatcher. I've got the Sumatran orangutan. I have a blue-fronted lorikeet. I, a Sumatran rhinoceros. I have a Yangtze River dolphin that paints silver portraits of its lips on my cash register. I love the Western lowland gorilla. Her name's Lolly Madly, and she sings lullabies to the passing water beneath our feet. A vaquita, a hawksbill sea turtle. Let's pack them in, my friends. Let's save the day like a pagan's ark re reveling in the sea. Easy now, now easy. Let's do something, yes? What's that, see? Go on and say it, see? Pile drive your words into our chest. Work that mighty intent up your throat and blast. Let's do something now. Say it. Amigos, I know we can certainly do it. Say it. Hurry, my tripas are curdling from the suspense. Gross. Let's close our eyes and think of the impossibilities of it. The possibilities of the impossibility of really seeing it. What do you mean, see? You've lost me. I give up. I'm about to faint. I fainted. Be patient. What I mean is what will ultimately happen to the three of us. Please explain. Please explain, A says. Okay, please explain, A says. I'll explain. This is just to say what will happen to the three valiant parking attendants who boldly dreamed of horses sowing planes. Come again? The muscular magic of automobiles begging entry, the piston push, the gas pedal pump, the wild hearted parking attendants whose sole mission was to rescue the general populace from toenail clippers and bad smelling deodorant. And don't forget the canned laughter. I mean, like unicorns and mermaids, maybe, like a wild stampede of Tonka trucks crawling over the main, main chins of mediocrity will be. We wait, and then.
as it happens in this rooftop is nearly an overheated radiator cap. The seams can no longer contain what they were meant to contain. Should I continue to wait? Should we continue to contain? We feed them. Feed them what? Magic mushrooms, chapulines, imperial worms. Let's retrofit the terraces of our imaginations for our progeny to gaze from. This event must happen soon. Do you think they'll come? I can't see one vehicle approaching. I do remember the days. How intense their arrival. I thought I'd break a limb. So many personalities, so many colorful jerseys, painted faces, the faded concert tees, the smiles, the anticipation. At least for one day, no one cared about what they left behind. Say it loudly with me. At least for one day, at least for one day, they say together. But where are they now? They're coming. How do you know? Why else would we be here? Not sure. Why would they pay us? They do they. We're here to serve the event. If there were no events planned to serve, what be our purpose? Out of habit, maybe? Out of habit? Well, you asked, why else would we be here? And I simply asked, out of habit, maybe. Does money have the capacity to create habits? They have. These menageries were we built are extraordinary, wouldn't you see? Imagine, would you say? Imagine what we could charge to view them. I must admit, though. Admit, though, what? I'm nearly out of room. Maybe that's the event we should all hope for. Don't invite such a spectacle. Imagine what they would do to such a thing. They ruin everything. They trample and stumble and grovel without ever considering a single consequence. Everything expendable these days. Objects of momentary desire, like children, these heads that drive. Hyperbole, expendable like us. Speak for yourself. I'm, I'm a unique attribute. We all are. There are none of us more valuable. Are you rubbing your chin, see? See, have you chewed your fingernails? You do know something of me, don't you? together. We do. Easily distracted is what I'm saying. We do. Not me, them. Where are they now? Probably marinating at some venue near a strange coast, considering the new show in town. I bet near an RV park with closed circuit television and blue-haired phonies taking tickets at a rubber door that smells of engine oil. Perhaps a hunger artist, they laugh. Or an old man with angel's wings, they laugh harder. They, they search for windmills, they laugh. I think we're too hard on them. Perhaps, but they do deserve some level of reproach. I'm thinking the tyrants. The tyrants, eh? The tyrants are within all of us, really. Vladimir, Estragon, Pozo, yuck, that old scold, luck, Godo. To dog, a dog is simply repeating itself. Which of us is leashed? You are leashed to your bloated and babbling scripture de jour. Oh, come on, see, be light. I be light in books, I say. Dynamite beneath the reading lamp. I am the gunpowder powder bowels of truth. When do they come? By the time they arrive, we may be, might be a bit demented. We might be slobbering fools. I think you've arrived. I'm writing my living will as we speak. B and C, I leave to you this kiosk and all of its appendages. They laugh. My leash is glittered. My leash encircles the great gulf and brings its breezes to me. So that's the first scene. Okay, so that just goes on and on. So in our paper. <laughs> um, I, I, can you hear me okay with this? It's not popping too much. Right? I tend to do that. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to read. Hmm. Okay. Actually, I'm going to read. Oh, okay. I'll finish with this. So this is called the insurmountable. And in, in this one section of the book, there's this character by the name of Nestor, Nestor, right? And um, like four or five pieces. And this is one of them. All right, here we go. The world might be motherfucking cuckoo, but my homeboy Nestor's not, that's for sure. Nest is just the neighborhood peludo inching in the dark like some mole in time. My boy Nest is smart as fuck and his science might very well explain why there's a jungle in my kitchen where a three-headed monster shakes ass deep bamboo trees behind my refrigerator just to frighten me. This morning, an insincere warthog stole a jar of Nutella from my snack drawer and thought it funny to leave a note that read, your rent's due, motherfucker. I saw a wolverine nursing a fox last week while I reached for a glass of almond milk so beautifully tender in the twilight until a slick mouth lemur mimicked my end of the month complaints about the rising water bills with bean chihilium in its mouth. 
This kitchen is a shit-talking ostrich provoking the goofy eye vulture perched up high up to double down and die on my life insurance policy. The kitchen, this kitchen is a blue haired stoner smoking herb with a marsupial intent on pocketing all of my cutlery. I spend most mornings spraying mosquito repellent all over my trembling body before an hour wasted clearing ocotillo bushes with a machete just to deliver my beloved panecito to the toaster. Damn those scandalous ass hyenas with those beach ball laughs. What kind of forest is this, Nestor? Nestor says I have no imagination and that I die before I had ever lived if, I, if I'm not careful with what I have, whatever the fuck that means. If only Nestor could devise a rocket ship with all that science he thinks, I'd buy admission tickets for me and the me's I might leave behind to lift off my kitchen countertop and soar someplace I've never truly been, divorced of the down here dull on gravity me, oh hey, to kick and paw wildly at the sun. Overcoming a forest in my kitchen is insurmountable. Nestor taught me that word. I believe it isn't as insurmountable as previously thought to actually inhabit the moon, he said. But I would never, ever do that. You know why? Why, Nestor? Why, I asked. It's because my father already sees enough of that astronomical darkness in me. And I like that. All science and shit. But Chicano goth at the same time. Con ese corazón sote, Nestor possesses beneath his bitch like a little, little ashtray that tries hard, hard, hard to pacify a night of burning cities in its grasp. But for real, Nestor needs to break up with books from time to time. Break up with those motherfuckers, I say. Too many in your head and they become battery acid for the brain. I swear I hear pages flipping inside his dome while he's standing on the front porch saying nothing, perhaps daydreaming about the great oceanic innervations of the intergalactic psyche, perhaps, as he likes to say while using his favorite word, perhaps. Of course, I can only assume, perhaps, but one thing's for sure, he's always still, javelin straight, an obelisk on the street corner of eternity, and I doubt he'll ever put down those damn books, not even for one hot ass minute. But that joint I borrowed about growing mushroom gardens and kitchen cabinets, wow, and now my visions have declared sovereignty. Oh, Nestor's bear traps around my broiler to protect the steaks he's been manning, but I'm vegetarian. That meat's for the dying lion, he says, though I've never seen it, nor do I ever want to. The thought of an accidental encounter makes me shiver. We must always think about the dying lion in the light, he said. And when I look at Nestor's eyes as he reports this shit, I can tell he means it. And this is what hurts me for reasons I cannot openly express in a poem written from the jungle of my days. Nestor visits me most like afternoons just to set me on the kitchen floor for a lion that might never roar anymore. This nonsense Nestor's grown in my kitchen fills me with great anguish, though I must admit the air I breathe these days embodies a glorious pine needle, glorious honey, glorious and wild lavender that just startles me into living. I exist to revere this plight, Nestor's dream, nightmare meat for the willing. Thank you. So, you know, you need to be like the first folks to get your hands on a copy of this book. Um, they are for sale over here. Venmo and are you taking cash? Or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, all forms of payment almost uh, uh, are accepted. So yes, if you're interested in grabbing a book, maybe getting it signed, come on up here. Um, thank you all again for being here for our kickoff event. Hope to see you next week, March 1st, for another fabulous reading. Get home safely. Yes, thank you. <laughs>